Guys, welcome to the podcast. This is going to be a fun episode with my friend Jason Harrison, the founder of Kuyu. And we're going to talk about his uh, awesome sheep hunt that he was just on where he harvested an absolute giant ram, the largest Nelson Eye Desert Bighorn sheep ever harvested, uh, not only in the state of California, but anywhere. Uh, and it's a phenomenal story. Can't wait to share it with you. I want to thank you guys for all your support of the podcast. I really appreciate getting all of the direct messages on Instagram and the emails, uh, daily emails, uh, words of encouragement, questions, comments, and what have you. Uh, if you haven't sent me an email and would like to, you can at j- jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. You can send me a direct message through Instagram at jscottoutdoors. And I just really appreciate uh, the loyal support that you guys uh, show this podcast. Uh, we continue every day now to be uh, just breaking new records of uh, numbers of downloads. And I just appreciate all of you that are sharing this with your friends and, and family and, and what have you. So um, it's it's just awesome. The support is incredible. Thank you so much. I want to thank the sponsors. Uh, Go Hunt Insider is the title sponsor of this podcast. Uh, Kuyu Ultralight Hunting, Phone Scope, com and the outdoorsmans and uh, each one of these companies is very special to me they've been hugely supportive of me and and all of the things that I do uh, here on the podcast as well as on all my hunts and such and I appreciate all the support that you guys show them I hear from these companies a lot and uh, hear uh, from them that uh, you know they, they love listening. You guys love listening to the podcast, but they love supporting my podcast because of the, the loyal support you guys show them. So thanks for that. Uh, you can look down in the show notes of this podcast uh, to see how to get a hold of these companies. Uh, and you can use the different J. Scott promo codes uh, to get discounts. And um, guys, just thanks for your support. Let's get right to this episode with Jason Harrison. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have a special episode with Jason Harrison, the founder of Kuyu, Kuyu Ultralight Hunting to be exact. And uh, Jason just got uh, done, finished uh, with his uh, Grand Slam of sheep. He finished in the state of California, his home state. Uh, And we're going to talk today on the podcast about that hunt and how it all went down. But first, Jason, how are you doing? Still on cloud nine, Jay. I don't know that I want to I come off it anytime soon either. <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> a great spot of, to be. In. It's a great spot to be in. One of the things we're going to talk about today is, you know, having such a pinnacle of a hunt. Um, you know, finishing your grand slam in your home state. You know, dream come true. Uh, you know, once you once you complete such a pinnacle and you're you're at such a high. Um, I would imagine there it's a possibility to have a letdown. I mean, it's you're a, you're an ex professional football player. Uh, you've done athletics as a kid growing up. Like it's almost like when you've won the Super Bowl. How how do you wake up the next morning and you know continue to 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 push yourself to you know strive to 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 get better? You know, I, I haven't gone there yet. I am still, you're still enjoying you're still flying high. And, and I'm trying to marinate in this moment as long as possible. But I don't it's a good question. Me. You know, you kind of go, what's next, right? Especially yeah. with the sheep we we hunted and the sheep we found and were able to to harvest. The question is don't where do you go think, from there? Yeah, I mean, but don't you think, Jason, too, that you bring up a good point of like, you know, sometimes as – you know, type A type personalities like you are, like I am, like a lot of us are, like instead of savoring the moment, I love hearing you say that, that you're savoring the moment, that you're enjoying it. And, you know, it's kind of one of those things I think in life a lot of times we don't smell the roses and uh, I think we should more. Any thoughts on that? No, it's so true. I mean, you're like me, right? You're like, okay, I got there, now what's next? This has been one of those moments for me, and, and I think it's, you know, there's, it's a grand slam, and that's always been a lifelong dream of mine, but it's, the, it's Goliath, it's the sheep, it's, it's the home state, it's all the sleepless nights and stress and tough moments in building my business and my career that my wife and I have gone through from, 
you know, wonder how we're going to make payroll the next day to how we're going to, you know, sell enough product to, to pay our bills to get to the point where you can afford that tag and my wife buy it for me as a present and then as a gift and then to get here and to find Goliath after so many people have tried and failed and then, you know, get to the point where we are now and just like, yeah, what's, you know, what's next? And really this one's been, been one that I've, you know, it's been a week now, um, been eight days since, since we, we found them and, and were able to, to get them. And I still haven't gone and to to the point of what's next, I just really keep going back and look at the pictures, and enjoy the moment. And um, as Christians, I've got to see in a mood like this. I almost, you know, I can't remember. I mean, just good mood every day. And I think I've been in my, you know, we, I've got a basement where I keep all my gear and store stuff, and I've got his horns down there. And I've been down there every morning and every night when I go home from work to go look at him and really just enjoy the moment. I, and I don't do that enough. And I don't think a lot of us, when we're our type A do enough in life you know to try to just go okay this is a this is something that's special and to sit in it for a while and be in the end of hunting season and to 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 accomplish what i've accomplished and to have goliath and and really i've i've probably i got to say i've done a really good job enjoying the moment which i don't do enough of well it's fantastic it's the largest nelson i ram that i know of ever harvested not just in the state of california but period um, it and, is and a, and a it's phenomenal achievement. Ever. Yeah, it's the biggest ever. And I mean, it's very, very rare to be able to say that you harvested an animal that's the biggest ever in, in the, their own species, like the biggest ever, you know, not just state record, not, I mean, just like the biggest ever. I mean, it's an unbelievable accomplishment. I want to bounce back to something you said there, because I think it's real important. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of people see you on Instagram, a lot of people see the, the, the building of your company. Uh, n you know, not everybody was there at the beginning when you started. Uh, and I know you, and I've heard a lot of stories from you. I've heard a lot of stories from your friends, family, etc. One of the things that I think is, is so cool is that truly your story is like a true American story from a business aspect from a life aspect uh, in the fact that um, you know you didn't come with a silver spoon in your mouth you you didn't you know you weren't handed a company uh, you, you know the, so much in these day and age it's you know we, we all know people that have had success because they were handed success and then I'm not saying at all uh, you know that your parents didn't play a pivotal role in shaping who you are and and who you are as a man and what have yep. you, but you came from humble beginnings, and, uh, you know, I've met your father. I've had dinner with your father. You know, he, he's a very grounded person. He's, a, he's an incredibly, I mean, if anybody listening would meet Jason's dad, you would just know <laughs> why you are the way you are, and it's one of those yeah, things. he's a tough guy, isn't I, he? I he's a tough guy, and, but he's one of those, you know, he shakes your hand firm, and it's like, I love the fact that you started another company, you, you grew it to an incredible success, then you moved on and created Kuyu. You know, you, you probably still would be with the other company if, you know, circumstances wouldn't have happened and such. We've talked about that before. But here you yep. are, you, you started it all over again. I mean, it was yeah, the I mean, perfect opportunity to say, hey, I you know, I sold the first one, very successful, and, but to do it again and to do it basically you and your wife, like, you know, mortgaging everything you have and, you know, basically going all in again and saying, you know, you, you, know, you, you laid it all on the line, and then to have success to having the, the success of the company it's just a, it's a true american if you're if you like capitalism Thanks, at all yeah. there's no better story i, I well, just thank you your thoughts I mean, on that you know i mean i gotta pinch myself every day I get to come here like we've talked about and you know i mean how much i appreciate where i am in my life but like you said it's i mean i'm 100 percent self-made um wasn't handed a thing didn't start with money um you know, I started Sitka with a dream, with no experience, out of my out of my garage, not knowing how I'm going to pull off this dream. Was able to do so, and then, 
you know, when we when I we sold Sitka, it was at the bottom of the economy, and we, I didn't get a paycheck. I didn't get a big check from it. Didn't get anything from it. In fact, starting Kuyu, I was really arguably in a worse financial situation than I was when I started Sitka because I used equity in my house to start Sitka. I didn't have it anymore with Kuyu and was able to scratch together some initial money to to get it up and going and and borrow some money from some people to 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 get it to where we are today. But yeah, to do it once, you, you you always wonder, you know, were you lucky? And then the next one I knew with Kuyu, well, I'll find out if I was lucky or, or I'm good at building companies and having a vision and driving that vision forward to success. And, um, you know, I always tell people if, if I can do it, anyone can do it. You just got to be relentless and stubborn enough not to give up and realize that dream. And um, this is just all part of it. And uh, I feel very fortunate um, where I am today in my life and what I've accomplished and um, none of it was given to me. All of it was earned. And, you know, this is just a byproduct and have an opportunity to buy this tag and to hunt Goliath and realize that Grand Slam was part of my dream. It's a byproduct of all of that work. And none of it was, you know, thinking that I'd ever get to this point. It was just focused on the next day um, and all the details of, of the next day to, to make sure that we we're doing the right things to, to realize success. And one day you look up and it's in front of you, you know, and it's happened. And if I can do it, anyone can do it. And I always find it so one of the coolest things I get is emails or Instagram messages or, or comments from customers saying, God, you, you, you know, what, you create great inspiration that I can do what I want to do with my life. And that, those are the biggest compliments to me from, from customers and from people because that's pretty cool. Nothing's, nothing, nothing better than that. Yeah, I, 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 think, um, I think that's just awesome. You know, no, thank one you. thing I – I think I need to bring up, you know, along the way, and anyone that has had success, you always have people that are willing to try and, you know, poke holes, so to speak, or yeah. try and chop the tree down or sad, what have it? you. And it, it is sad. It, it, it's sad. It, you know, I have seen you take some negative critique. Um, and, and I just wonder, you know, asking you personally, like, how do, how do you and what advice would you give to other people that are in similar situations, uh, you know, whether they have a, a, a big company of the magnitude of business that you do or just in everyday life, uh, you know, as you see success and a, as you flourish and what have you, we've all faced situations where, you know, people automatically go on the attack and, and yep. you know, nobody, nobody is shielded from it. No, Some people today. handle it better than others. I'm just curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, and especially today, Jay, as, as you and I have talked about with social media and the ability for people to hide behind it um, and to make comments, make disparaging comments um, public and really not have to stand up or be the face behind those comments that happens more today than ever. You know, I look at it as, you know, and I, and I deal with my kids, and my kids ask me about it because my son has Instagram, and he sees the comments that come up, and he's like, geez, Dad, doesn't that, doesn't that hurt your feelings? And, and it doesn't, unfortunately, anymore. You know, we, uh, I, I know I talked to Cash. I said, unfortunately, you know, those are those people's issues, and they're not mine. And if I had a chance to meet that person, I'm sure they'd have a different opinion of the person that I am versus the person they're trying to portray me to be on social media. And that's how I look at it, and it's it's just – you know, it's gonna. It happens with success, and you know, I've, I've met a lot of great people through business, and a lot of great people that have that have been self-made, and and they talk about it too. That you know, it, success can be a lonely place because people, you know, find people that that are successful. Some people find it threatening versus inspiring, and and I just have to take it as what it is and, and not take it personally. And, and, you know, I try to respond to those people in a positive way and talk about, you know, what the reality is of who I am as a person and, and how I've gotten there. And if they continue to want to um, look at me in negative light, I, ca I can't fix that, you know, and that's how yeah. I look at it. And, you know, I know you've dealt with it as well. And it's, it's unfortunate, but that's just human nature. And it's not going to discourage me from still pushing forward and trying to, to continue to accomplish the dreams I want to accomplish. It's just life, I suppose. Just more prevalent today with social media. It really is. I mean, and, and you've built 
to you kind of on the back of transparency, on the back yeah. of social media, on the back of you know, telling people exactly what you're doing. And you know, you've got social media where uh, you know, there, are, there are some extreme positives and then there's, there's also some negatives. And it, it's interesting to hear your perspective. And, and, yeah, um, I mean, there's been negatives about Goliath. There's a negative about, you know, well, it's a guided hunt. You paid for the ram. You bought the ram. Well, you know, um, no, I didn't. As you know, you earn every trophy you hunt. Um, you know, if, uh, you know, certain animals you have to hire guides. Certain animals you don't. Um, for me now, uh, and I grew up hunting public land, doing all my own research, never hiring guides, figuring it all out myself like you have. And as business become more successful and, and eats up more of my time, I just don't have the time to do the homework and the research to go scout and to go spend time to 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 do the work that I normally would be able to on some of these hunts. And so I I hire a guide at times to go do some of these hunts, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and it's just it's an opportunity I have and I can afford, and I take advantage of it. And people want to look at it as a negative, or that I'm not a good hunter because of that. And that's you know those are those are their issues, not mine. Well, the reality is, it, it, the way I see it, is that most people, given the circumstance, and, and, and I've even seen other people, you know, claim DIY, claim they never go guided, claim all this, you know, they only hunt public, they'd never hunt private. But I've seen it time and time and time again, over and over and over, where some of those same people all of a sudden they get a little success themselves, they get a little bit of you know, financial stability, their time becomes a little more valuable because you know, whatever they've got going on, and all of a sudden mm -hmm. now they are going with a guide. Now they are going on private. And so private, yeah. I think if, if, if people really honestly looked at the situation, instead of you know, trying to throw stones, they would say, yeah, I mean, if I had that, you know, the money that Jay Scott did or that Joe Blow did or that Jason Harrison did or that, so, you know, each one of us can always say, oh, if I had such and such money. I mean, you know, maybe the richest guy in the world would be the only person that would say, hey, you know, I, I guess I'm the top I, if I had his money. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, totally. you're, you, everybody's always at a different stage. Um, but I just, the, the whole you know, I, I just, we've talked about it on my podcast before in several episodes, not with you specifically, yeah. but just how people, it, it's, it's just embarrassing sometimes how people try and, you know, rip people down for being successful. And sometimes being successful means you don't have as much time. And, and, sure. uh, you know, I wish people could see the guy that came on the coos deer hunt with me who, enjoyed every aspect of it, enjoyed the sure. struggle, in, in, you know, embraced the suck of the hunt and thrashing through the brush and, you know, all that kind of stuff and just smiled the whole time and was the first guy up at camp and, you know, in the morning going, where are we going today? What's going on? You know, and, <laughs> and, and, and not the guy that rolls out of the, you know, sleeping bag and is like, you know, where's my coffee and, you know, where's the Where's my deer going to yeah. yeah, where's my deer so I can shoot and go home? Like, yeah. So anyway, from, from, a, from someone watching from a distance on some of this and, and knowing you as well as I do, it does frustrate me sometimes to hear and see. Sure. And then to think that Cash, you know, bless his heart, your kids read some of the, just the foul language and some of the stuff. It, just, it bothers me, I'll be honest with you. No, I know it does, and you know, and it, it it bothers me too to a certain extent. I've just dealt with it so much over the years that I've gotten used to it. Unfortunately, I get callous to it. And some of the comments about you know you hunt private or you do this or do that, and and you know your hunt's easy compared to my hunt, and that same person's putting in for premium tags and hopefully it gets drawn. It's like, well, if if your goal is to make it as challenging as possible, why are you putting in for premium tags? Why are you putting in for limited draw tags? Why aren't you hunting public land the most? you know, congested hunting area possible where the most people hunt because if that's really what you're trying to do, that's where you should be hunting and they don't. It's just where do you draw the line, right? Yeah, yeah. Good um, point. Anyways. Good point. I want to talk about this um, ram and the whole hunt. I want to talk about, you know, the, the mental prep and some of the things yeah. you guys went through. Before we get to that, uh, I do want to ask you what's going on with Kuyu. I know the big holiday season's coming up. Your largest sale of the year is coming up November 16th tomorrow. through the 19th. Tomorrow. Starting yeah, tomorrow. And tomorrow. what, you know, what's going on at Kuyu? 
We are cranking. You know, it's it's been a great year for us. We've um, you know financially gotten a really strong position. I brought in some outside capital at the beginning of this year, as you know, to put really um, to put Kuyu in a position to really better service our customers globally. We you know we talked about it earlier this year. We've got demand in Europe. We weren't servicing very well and creating a very good shopping experience there because of how long it took to get our product and. And the duties and taxes have to pay when it got there finally, and ability to exchange returns. We we been able to solve a lot of just um, problems on inventory and inventory levels, and servicing our customers globally in a significant way. We made big improvements there. We're seeing significant growth in international markets for KU, and and we've been able to innovate with a lot of new products this year. Some really cool stuff that just came out recently, like the Superdome Pro and um, some new packs this year that came out, and we've got a lot in the pipe for, for next year. We're just looking at all the new product introductions. We have like 50 new products we're going to introduce uh, throughout next year, some really innovative stuff, some new fabric developments, some new technologies that are going to come out and just continue to evolve the product line and, and evolve and expand kind of, you know, just the range of conditions we can take our products to. Some some interesting stuff that's coming out. I don't want to give out too much, but um, we've got a lot happening here. Uh, as a company, and we're in a really, really good spot. We've had an amazing run this this hunting season and through the fall as far as growth year over year, and uh, we're just in a really, really good position as a company for the future. I couldn't be more excited about where this company is headed. I know we've talked in prior podcasts about uh, some of the struggles with this fast as Kuyu has been growing year over yep. year and almost being able to not even predict, you know, it goes beyond your wildest predictions even. It did. And how yes. tough that is as, as a founder and as, you know, the guy in charge and pushing this company. I know we've talked about issues with, with, it, with it growing so much with inventory and some of that. And so by bringing in some additional capital for the person out there that maybe didn't catch it, like this is going to allow Kuyu as a company to have – more inventory in stock mm -hmm. and and deal with some of those issues, right? Yep, it is, and that's been our biggest challenge um, as the, for the first you know six years of this company is the lack of capital to buy inventory. And I did, you know, we talked about it earlier this year, but I did it on purpose. I didn't want to dilute this company, dilute my ownership of this company, have control of the future of this brand by bringing in outside capital uh, to chase demand early on, which is what we did at Sitka, and one of the reasons why the company was sold, and I couldn't, you know, uh, really beyond what I wanted to see happen with the company at the time we sold it, and I just didn't want to do that again because I wanted to keep this company um, grounded. I want this company to, you know, be able to grow and become a large global brand with the same DNA it was started with, and that doesn't always happen when you raise money early on because you get diluted and the founder's vision and dreams get uh, to the point where they can't control all the decisions being made. And, I'm, and I waited uh, on purpose till the value of this company got so so high and so large um, that I could raise money and not give up control. And that's, the, that's why I waited and that's why I also brought in the money to finally really start to service the demand and service the customers with higher inventory levels and and like what we, some of the initiatives we did with international and and inventory levels were the highest inventory position um, going into our holiday season we've ever been in and through the fall. So we've we've made some big strides this year. That's great. You know, you mentioned yeah. the Super Down Pro jacket. I've been, I, you know, you remember at the CA uh, in Montana when we were elk hunting and, and the <laughs> snow hit and. Brendan was rolling around in his Super Down Pro, and I, I, I can't tell you how many times I wanted to sneak over into the cabin in the middle of the night and steal his jacket and be wearing it the next morning. You should have. Just to, see, oh, uh, just to see the look on his face. But <laughs> when someone's wrestled at Ohio State, uh, uh, even though I probably outweigh him and, and taller than him, I don't yeah. know that I was going to mess with that. But uh, I love that jacket. I've got it now. I've been wearing it. I was curious, is that, is that a Super Down Pro which for those listeners out there, it basically has twice the installation of the Ultra. Um, and it, it's, I mean, for me, it, it feels twice as warm, Jason. And it, but it's yeah, still maybe super even, light. Even more than that. Yeah, it's only 17 ounces, which is amazing. And uh, it's got a heavier uh, outer fabric, so it's a little more durable. And I think that also helps hold a little bit more heat in, which makes it even, you know, probably even more than twice as warm as the, you know, Super Down Ultra. And it's it's cut larger, so it can be worn as an outerwear or pullover. 
your outerwear first sitting back and glassing some of the pants. So, yeah, it's a great piece, great addition to the line for later season stuff. It's been phenomenal here in Colorado, um, although yeah. we've had fairly mild here, but we've had, you know, this morning it was 14 degrees, you know, riding in the Ranger with no windshield. I mean, I, I was wearing it and was comfortable. And um, w- was, that a, was that a product that you personally wanted to make, or was that from customer feedback saying that they wanted uh, a, another piece that maybe for colder weather? Yeah, more, a lot of it's customer feedback on that one. You know, I don't do a lot of late season stuff. A lot of our sheep hunts, as you know, up north are in August, and, and we just don't need that cold of of jacket and pants. Um, you know, I've done some colder hunts, like the, I did a float trip for grizzly bears with Lance up in Alaska in October. We sure, certainly could have used it there, and some other um, colder hunts, like my moose hunt uh, up in up at Dueling Stone a couple years ago, got really cold, and I was testing that product there. But a lot of it's customers asking for it, wanting something that they could pull over, more of a belay style. When they're sitting behind glass or doing these colder, later, you know, late season, third season hunts like in, in Colorado where the temperatures really drop. And just, you know, we're always looking to expand the range of our products. You know, we're, our initial focus was, you know, you know, ultralight backpack, earlier season stuff. But the goal has always been to expand it and to, to cover more situations for our customers that may face. And speaking of expanding, I noticed, and it kind of caught me off guard because I, I, I know that a women's line, uh, we've talked about it before, not really being a focus of Kuyu because of, you know, yeah. you studying the business models and such. But then I notice a, a limited edition women's jacket, you know, a, a, a women's super down ultra hooded jacket. Uh, I, I got an email about that and was curious uh, how the, the feedback has been from that and the success uh, and the sales and such from that piece, and was that is that a test piece, or was that just um, something that you thought you would you you know you, you would you would create for those women? You know, it's it's a it's kind of a combination of the two, Jay. We you know we've had a lot of requests by women, um, wives of customers that are wearing their husbands' super down jackets, and we thought it'd be a good holiday introduction. And women always love, everyone loves a great down jacket, especially our ultras. Mm-hmm. I mean, Absolutely. Days, hardly anything keeps you incredibly warm, packs on that pocket. They could put it in their, their handbag or, or purse or always have it with them. And also a way just to see and test the depth of the market. I mean, I, my research has told us that there's not a, that the market isn't there, um, the size of the market isn't there to really support the financial investment for you to go all in into women's and, and find out if the market's there. And this is a way for us to introduce a, a product and kind of a product that we know that would sell well for women and see, truly test the market. We have a unique opportunity with this business model to do things like this. You know, we don't have to come out with a whole product line and have a retail buyer pick up a product line of, of Kuyu Women's to to, enter, to test the market. We can introduce a product like this and, and see how it sells. If it does well, then we'll look at potentially adding another style or two and see how those do. And if it continues to, to sell through well, then, you know, maybe we continue to expand into women's. Um, we, this is truly a, just a test and see if the uh, demand is deeper than what my market research is telling me. Yeah, it's good stuff. You know, something to point out, too. Uh, I noticed Cash uh, was wearing uh, a lot of Kuyu, all Kuyu stuff, and I know you're working on a youth line. You've talked about it before. And, and something to point out for the listeners, I think that's important, is that this youth line uh, is, is going to be expansive enough that there are plenty of opportunities for uh, women to probably fit into some of the upper end sizes of the, the, the youth line. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I may be speaking out of turn, but I think that's going to be a great opportunity as well uh, for those listeners that have wives that maybe want to... Um, you know, have a little bit smaller size than, say, uh, you know, the smallest of the men's uh, offerings uh, might be a great opportunity there. Any thoughts or did you think that there would be some crossover there with the youth? Yeah, we've heard, we've heard that before. If, if we offered smaller sizes or youth sizes that, um, you know, petite women would be able to fit within those. It's, it won't be a perfect fit. I, you know, if, again, if this test run goes well, I'd much rather have, you know, a women's line that had the correct fits for, for women. But this, if we don't, this would certainly be a potential solution for women. And, and the youth line right now is slated 
my goal is to have it out in the fourth quarter of next year for kind of this time next year as a holiday introduction for, for the youth line. I'm hoping to have it out sooner, but um, it's just gotten pushed on um, on inventory buys for the spring, and it got pushed to fourth quarter of next year. We're kind of finalizing everything right now on the on the youth line, and should should have it out uh, um, the latest by holiday season of next year's what is slated that as of um, today. So it's great. I mean, Cash is excited about it, uh, and I've gotten massive response from the photos I've shared with Cash in it um, on all of our recent hunts, and I know it'll do well. And, you know, every every kid wants to wear what their dad's wearing, and I'm excited to get it out. It's turned out really cool. I mean, they're, it's it's so cute to see little mini versions of Kuyu in the youth lines. That's so cute. Yeah, it sure is. Let's get to this sheep hunt. Yeah. Um, one of the one thing that I think is so cool is that you know being a California resident, uh, growing up in California, living in California, you know your business is in California. Um, you finish your your Grand Slam in California. When the opportunity arose, uh, your wife thought it would be a great opportunity to reward your many years here of. of you know, putting it all on the line and, and, and putting it out there to, to, you know, work so hard to make Kuyu a success. And then once it did become a success, you know, she was, correct me if I'm wrong, she was kind of the driving force in wanting to make sure that you got rewarded uh, and, and thought that was a, a really cool thing. Um, yeah, talk was. a little bit about finishing in California and, and before the yeah. hunt sold, like, you know, your thought process behind it. Well, two years ago, Jake, a little over two years ago, Jake uh, from Kika uh, Guides and Worldwide Outfitters, who I hunted with, had a hunt up here in Northern California for, I think, two elk with a client. He stopped out by the office, and he showed me a picture of Goliath and said, check out this ram we're hunting that, he had, that they'd been, they, they had known about. And showed me the picture of it, and the second I saw the picture, in the back of my mind, I thought, and just had an instant connection to that sheep, and, and I don't know why I've never really had this with a particular animal. Seen a picture of it, but I thought I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find a way to, to hunt and, and harvest that ram. And that was two years before, you know, before today. And there was nothing that, you know, at that point that Jake was sharing with me the reason I he wouldn't be able to find it and kill it that year. But my gut just told me that it was going to be a sheep that I was going to have the opportunity to harvest in my lifetime. And, and I just kept tabs on it for for that year, and, and you know, Jake had them, um, and they were watching them up until about four days before the season. They had them. They were sitting on them. I think they had them for 12 straight days, and all of a sudden, they woke up the next, you know, one morning, like four days before the hunt, um, and he was gone from the mountain they'd been watching them on, and they couldn't find him that season. They never relocated him. Um, the next year, I bid on the tag at Wild Sheep. And the price just went beyond what I was comfortable spending on it. Was it was a, you know resetting the record of of the previous year of, of what the record was for that tag, and I quit bidding. I think at one hundred sixty thousand on it, and it sold for one sixty five to Dan Smith. And they hired a, a different outfitter um, last year, and they couldn't find him, even though they were looking for him for the for his hunt. And so he made it through through last year's auction tag holder as well. And then the, I was not at Wild Sheep this year. I had to go, I was invited by the Trumps to, to join them for the inauguration, as you know, and, and it was the night of the presidential inauguration, and we're actually at a post party with, with Donald Trump Jr. And, and his wife and kind of a, a VIP party with them, and, and um, Brandon texted me and said, hey, the tag's up for auction in about five minutes, and I told Kirsten, i got to step out and go bid on the tag, and, and she reached over and grabbed my phone from me and said, no, I'm going to bid on it. And I said, no, whoa. no, I need to, I mean, this is really important to get it. She's like, I know, that's why I'm going to bid on it, because you and Brendan will let common sense get in the way of you getting this tag, and thankfully she did, because I wouldn't have spent the amount of money or felt comfortable spending the amount of money that, that she ended up um, buying it for, which at the time... I'm so glad she did. <laughs> she came back and she said, the tag's yours. And I said, how much? And so I, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I thought, yeah. um, I'm so lucky. And uh, <laughs> so that's how I ended up with it. And thank God she bet on it. And Brendan was trying to talk her out of it. He, she, he was like on the phone going, uh, Kirsten, that's too much. And she's like, bid. And he'd come back and say, Kirsten, seriously. And she'd all bid again, bid again, 
bit again until it was ours. It was classic. So that is thankfully awesome. for her that you know, as a, otherwise I wouldn't have I wouldn't have been in the situation to have the tag. Um, so that's that, that's a cool aspect of this whole thing. And then the big question then, when you spend that much money, is does he make it through the winter? You know, and he was really predictable as a sheep. He showed up to a certain guzzler on schedule every single July. And about the mid, 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 middle of July, he would show up in the rut on desert sheep down. That's kind of interesting. It happens like in the summer and then in through the early fall. I always thought it was later in the fall when the sheep would rut, but in that area, um, they rut earlier. And this summer, you know, it was, I left for stone sheep hunting in BC at the end of July, and he hadn't shown up. Um, and he'd normally show up by the, mid, by the middle of July. And so there was a bit of concern when I went into the mountains stone sheep hunting this summer. And the great thing was when I came out of the mountains, I had a whole bunch of texts and pictures from Jake that came flooding into my phone as soon as I got reception of pictures of Goliath. And knowing that he was alive was a big relief. Um, and then they are able to keep track of him uh, through the trail cameras and then went down and put eyes on him several times through September. Um, and then about the 20, I think it was the 28th of September, he disappeared. Um, and they he quit showing up on on cameras at the guzzlers, which isn't untypical. But usually he would stay within the unit, or they could keep track of him. But this year he just he just flat out disappeared a little bit earlier than they than he had normally um, disappeared. Um, and so they were scrambling. I mean, they had they were down in that unit on a regular basis early in October, and then about the twentieth they were down there full time for about two weeks prior to the to my hunt starting and. And they scoured the area. They glassed, I mean, day in and day out. They had three or four people join them, um, sitting behind glass in different high points throughout the Orcopas looking for the sheep, and, and they flat out couldn't find them. What kind of metal strain, you know, putting so much effort into this sheep? I know, um, look, I'm going to have Jake on the podcast as well and talk to him about it. But from yeah. your perspective, like witnessing and, you know, you – having this be a you know couple year quest and and knowing all the facts that you did like mentally were you like man what, you know surely he's he, you know i know on on several of these auction hunts that i've been involved with and certainly the last one with that curly ram you know yeah. your your mind plays funny tricks and you start saying well is he dead you know we think he's 11 or 12 years old sure you know could he be in a wash bottom somewhere just dead and you, you know, did that ever creep in, and, and what were your thoughts as far as, you know, trying to stay positive? Um, you know, my my instincts and my gut on, on Goliath were so strong. As I kept telling Jake, this is destiny, and I never doubted the fact that we'd find him. I never doubted the fact that um, he was alive. I just, my, my gut on Goliath was so strong and so strong that we'd find him. I never lost faith or hope i know jake didn't either although i think there's a lot more stress on his end feeling responsible for the fact that they couldn't find him and that he had disappeared again on him um the big question of this unit i don't know if you've seen where the or how the orocopas lay out and that unit lays out but right next to it is the chocolate mountains and i didn't realize how close they were until i got down there but literally the orocopas and there's a, a, a narrow wash with a dirt road that runs through it and the other side of that dirt road that's in the middle of this wash is the Chocolate Mountains, which are a bombing range for the military that are completely off limits. You can't go in there. And the, everyone's, you know, the, the question was, does he go to the chocolates? You know, is that where he disappears to? Because if he does, you can't hunt him. And he had mentioned that in the past. I didn't realize until I got down there how close they sat to our copas. And that was what I kept telling Jake. I and mean, when I got down there and looked at it, I was like, man, that just looks... Like, if you're not finding the, in this mountain range, and Oracopa is not a big range. Um, I think the, the unit's just like 20 miles long, but the range isn't that long, especially the area that has the habitat where the sheep live in it. And my, in my back of my head, looking at it after being in there, you know, we got in there Friday before I could hunt and glassed. Um, we had uh, five or six people in there helping us glass, and we didn't find them. And then Saturday, first day we climbed back up to Oracle Peak and, and we could really look over the area where we were the day before and the plan was that afternoon to hunt down through these really cut up canyons where we thought maybe he could be hiding and maybe just we hadn't found him because he's down in a canyon or a draw in this one section um, 
But after we climbed down to there Saturday, you know, in the back of my head, I was like, man, there's, I don't, don't think he's in there at Um And then I started talking to Jake. I said, you know, what's your thoughts about him being in the chocolate? Because you got to been in here for a month. You've looked, you've looked and seen every single sheep that you know about that's shown up on tarot camera throughout this year and last year. You've found every single ram, but you haven't found him. Why? Is what I kept thinking in my head. Why do you still think he's in the Aracopas if you if you haven't found him, but you found all the other sheep in there? And that was the big kind of question we had. You know, after I was down there with him on Sunday, um, and and, I, and so you know that was just my thought is I don't think he's in the Aracopas. Um Doesn't mean he wasn't in the unit, but if he's not there. Where is he? Um, and, you know, so Sunday we, you know, instead of hiking back up the mountains, there's this area called the Canyonlands, which is kind of the eastern end of the Oracopas where it's really broken up country. And they've been glassing in there and they've seen rams in there um, over the years and this year and, and the day before. Some of the guides were down in there looking for them. And we kind of put a full court press on, on the, what we call the Canyonlands in there on Sunday. And we glassed from a truck um, just kind of covering ground from the outside so I could stay mobile if one of the guides happened to spot him to get around to where we could close the distance on him in the canyon lands. And uh, it was in the middle of the day, and Jake and I are sitting there, and I said, you know, break, let's, let's look at the maps, and let's just go through the history of Goliath, every place you've seen him, when you've seen him. Um, and, you know, the thought of him going over to the chocolates, Jake just questioned, because there's the guzzler that he showed up on every year, in the summer was in the middle of the range and there's other guzzlers and other water sources between that guzzler and the chocolates and he just kept saying jason i just don't think he goes there because we don't he doesn't show up in any other water sources before in other words in other words he would hit something else before he hit the guzzler that he always shows up in. Exactly. So he's, and he's, and trying he's trying to deduce that he couples. doesn't come from that direction, right? Exactly. And that's what he kept telling me. Is, I just don't think so because we would have picked him up prior to that guzzler because that guzzler sits in the middle, right? And and so that was the that was his theory on it, and then he was right. Um, and also, you know, he the sheep all kind of congregate down the Rocopas for the rut. And so he, he kept saying, well, he'd have picked up ewes, and the ewes would have taken the guzzlers along the way before it got to that one, if that was the case. And so we just kind of went through the history of it, and then there was this one little isolated mountain range that um, – that was sitting in the unit and I talked to Jake about it and he's like, there's just no water there. And I don't, you know, we just don't sh- see sheep there. And I just, my gut was, well, I think we need to go look at it. And so we drove over to this, this side of the, of the range and looked in these, you know, really dry section and it ended up being not quite as dry as we thought it was. And there's a lot of barrel cactus in there. And Jake had told me how these sheep can live on barrel cactus, especially in the wintertime. And I just said, you know, let's spend some time looking there. Um, let's let's mark that off off of the list of of potential areas he could be in. And so we glassed it that afternoon. The next day, we, we kind of moved um, a couple other guides over there. We kind of looked at it from a bunch of different directions. And then on Tuesday, um, it opened on Saturday. On Tuesday, we kind of got into that section of the mountains a little deeper. And uh, we put a couple guides on high points, and we kind of went up through the middle of it. And uh, at 8.30 in the morning, one of the guides got a hold of us and, on the cell phone and said, hey, I just spotted some ewes, which we thought was a good sign. And then about 20 minutes later, Jake called the guy back or te- you know, got back a hold of the guide and um, said, hey, has anything showed up with the ewes? And he said, I don't know, let me check. And also he said, oh, my God, there's a giant ram with him. It's Goliath. And we found him. <laughs> and it was like... <laughs> oh, my God, in a spot that we weren't even considering Jake. I mean, Jake had looked in there, and he thought maybe possible, and he'd looked in there previously, but never really, you know, full court pressed it um, to get in there and look at all the little nooks and crannies, and, and he was in there. And uh, you know what talk I about a is, level of excitement and, oh, and just the sure. sense of relief and just, ah, oh, we got it. We figured it out. Like, and he wasn't being smart. He was just, I think, he just did this every single year, and nobody thought that that's what he did, so no one looked. Just being it a didn't sheep. make total sense. Yeah, just being a sheep and doing his thing. And um, they're an amazing animal because, you, you know, when you can see, you know, a lot of animals you hunt, and I'm curious your thoughts on this, a lot of animals you hunt, it's thick and what have you, and you think, oh, they could be right there. But it's pretty tough mentally when you're glassing and you can see pretty much everything 
other than you yep. know what's in those cracks and crevices, but you can actually glass forever. Yep. And then you just have to realize that they're probably not like purposely hiding from you. They're not like, oh, Jason's got the tag. He's just being a ram. But yep. when you've got miles and miles and miles of country to, to cover it, it can be daunting. Yeah, sheep are different, right? I mean, you've experienced it so much, Jay, with your sheep hunting experience. You know, the hardest part of killing a ram is finding them. Yeah. Unlike mule deer. I mean, mule deer, you can know there's a big mule deer there. He flat out can go knock, nocturnal, and yep. you can't kill him. Lay down. I mean, I experienced Never that come out of the brush. Yeah. I had a 242 tag, which is a great tag in Nevada, and we knew, I was hunting with Paul Stewart, there's a giant buck in this one area. We hunted him for seven straight days, and he just n never surfaced during the day. Sheep don't do that, as you know. They don't go nocturnal, so it's just the hardest part is figuring out in this massive range, you're hunting for a needle in a haystack of needles in that type of country. It's just being patient. But once you can find them, usually, I mean, in my experience, unless you just make a mistake, um, once you find them, if you, if you understand sheep and staying out of their sight and getting the wind in your favor, usually you, can, you have a really high success rate of, of killing them at that point. And so, yeah, we found him at 8.30 in the morning. Um, he was a long ways away. Uh, we had to actually hike back out to the truck and loop around to the end of this this section of the, of the range and then hike in and um, we were just really careful making sure the wind was good and that we could get a, an approach on them that kept us completely out of sight. As you know, their eyesight is just unbelievable. Um, and we are able to, to kind of come around um, a long ways around to be safe and cut up through these small ridges and then be able to climb to the back of this peak um, and pop up over the top. And he was bedded in a saddle at uh, about 285, 290 yards. And just when you first saw him, what, when you first peeked over and you actually saw him, what, what went through your mind? What did he look like? What was he doing? Uh, well, he was bedded, um, and he is super distinguishable. He is, his color phase on, on this, on Goliath is different than all the other desert sheep. He's, he's like this dark slate, I mean, just gorgeous, beautiful, dark slate gray color to him. Um, a little bit, uh, some of the other sheep we saw in there had a lot more brown to him. He was super identifiable. We knew that from the photos we had of, of him and the video Jake had of him from previous years. Um, he was with three other ewes and a small ram, and they're all bedded in the saddle. You know, I, you know, as we got up near the top, I told Jake, look, you, I'm just going to work on getting my, my gun set up, make sure I have a dead rest. You keep eyes on the sheep. I said, I'm only going to pop up to get the range, and then I'm going to be focused on getting set up on the rifle. And so we, you know, I, we, we came up and over. We could, I could see the sheep in the saddle. I popped up and over with my binoculars, grabbed the range on them, and then I just worked on setting the, the rifle up and then shooting a, a loophole scope. It's a 3x18, three, three and I had it on three powers. I got the rifle set up, and I got the crosshairs on them and then, twi and then dialed it up to 18 power. And it was the first time I was able to really look at them. <laughs> my next response was, oh, it back down. my <laughs> God. He is way bigger in person. And Jake told me that than the photos do justice of, and um, he certainly was. He was just, just like heart-stoppingly big as he's laying there. And, you know, Desert Chief. Did he face you? I, or he was. What, he was what, what, laying broadside what facing me. Oh. And, you know, desert sheep are just, they're so interesting because their bodies aren't that big for their horns. Different than, yeah. I'd hunted big horns for the first time the year before. Well, my big horn is 300-something pound animal. And Definitely. so the body's big with the horns. Well, these horns are bigger than the big horn, and he weighs almost half the weight. So yep. it looks obnoxiously big, as you know, on desert sheep, especially with a big ram like that. And the way he was facing us, and, and Goliath's horns dropped so low that I couldn't get a shot on him. I mean, his horns covered his chest. And so I told Jake as I got the crosshairs on him, I, I go, I can shoot forward and hit him right through the shoulder. Um, and Jake just said, that's too tight. Just... I don't want you to ricochet off the off the horns by chance. And I was like, I got a great rest. I make the shot. And Jake's like, I'd just rather have you wait. You got all the time in the world, which we did. They had no idea we were there. But there's always that moment of like, 
do I take the shot? What if something happens? What if the wind changes? What if they move, right? Or a sheep lays down and blocks the shot. And so I just, I listened to Jake and I sat with the crosshairs and just sat patient. And then he turned and looked straight, straight ahead. But then his horns <laughs> went back and deep so far down that he, com- he covered his chest even worse. So just a huge drop looking, and looking straight ahead, I couldn't oh shoot. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my so gosh. So we sat there I can for just probably picture that. 10 minutes, felt like an hour. And finally he turned and looked away and it opened up his chest and I, and I had the gun so well set up and, and um, as soon as he turned his head, I, I shot him and it was it was the easiest shot I've ever had on a sheep. I've never had a shot set up where the animal was in a position like that, bedded, had no idea we can get the range dialed. I had a turret on that gun, so I dialed on the exact yardage and as soon as he turned his head, a shot was made and and he stood up on the shot, and I shot him right through the heart. Um, and Jake goes, he's up. But I knew the shot was was perfect. And uh, put another bullet in and got the crosshairs back on him. About that time, I saw his legs start to stiffen up, and he started turning, and down he went. And I was just like, oh. Jake, I look over at Jake, and I've got tears running down my eyes. He's got tears running down his eyes. And he just looks at me and goes, do you realize what we just did? And I said, 100%. And I said, Jake, this is a moment I'll never forget. And I said, this is a this is a client that you have right now that that you, you have that truly truly appreciates what we've just accomplished and this is an absolute the trophy of my lifetime and and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. We just sat there in total awe and kind of silence for a while, just taking in the whole moment. And we didn't even rush down there to go see him. We just sat there and for about ten minutes and just kind of looked at each other like, oh my gosh, we did it. Yeah, incredible. Absolutely incredible. You know, honestly, sitting there for 10 minutes and, and having them with that pose, you know, it's I've never had the sheep in my hands, obviously, but looking at the pictures, having them face you and then having them turn where his horns are perpendicular, I mean, he had to look just oh, ginormous. And the pictures to, to really be able to hold it together, us. I yeah, was no, it, that, it, you know, sitting there for 10 minutes that I'd start shaking like a freaking dog, you know, and not be able to pull the shot off. It's almost like you'd rather just pop over and shoot them and be done with it. Was there any, I mean, how solid were you? And, and, you know, this is more than a sheep hunt. This is, you know, the grand slam. This is the, all this that we've been talking about. Like, was there any moment where you had to just, you know, settle yourself or were you amazingly calm? Amazingly calm. It's like, Wow. Been preparing for that moment my entire life, my entire hunting career, just a sense of calmness and comfort, and really like for the most I've ever had on an animal before I pulled the trigger, just soaking all the entire situation in and the entire moment in, and then after the shot, the same way, it wasn't like we jumped up and down, screamed and yelled. We just both sat back and literally had tears in our eyes and kind of looked at each other and just sat there I mean, neither of us wanted to get up and go even go down there we just kind of sat there for several minutes and I said told Jake I said I need to call a couple of people I called my wife and told person that we got him and she was screaming and excited <laughs> more than I was to a certain extent and, and I called my dad because he had been there for the first few days of the hunt and told him we you know we I called him that morning told him we found him and uh and then called him, and he was obviously incredibly excited and, you know, congratulatory, and we just kind of sat there. Finally, I'm like, well, I guess we should go down there and <laughs> go see him <laughs> after just kind of soaking it in. And we got down there and uh, and just sat with him for a long time. Um, and just just truly just, we, you know, it was 1 o'clock in the afternoon. We wasn't going to get dark until 5.30 or so. We sat there all afternoon with the sheep and just – all the other guys finally came and met up with us, and Brendan and, and Cash and Paul were sitting on another mountain. Um, they let us close the distance, and they came over and joined us, and I got to experience the moment with Cash, which is just epic. And, you know, Cash and I sat there for a long time looking at sheep and talking about the moment, and, I mean, it was totally surreal like nothing I've ever had before. It was an incredible, incredible day. You know, that was one of my favorite parts about watching kind of I was getting some reports from Brendan and, and, and you a little bit on the, on the hunt, but one of the, I was kind of just so excited to watch it go down. You were posting pretty regularly on Instagram, yeah. giving us updates and what have you. And to see cash there and, and 
to see how into it he was and, you know, just a cute little bugger for sure. I mean, that's <laughs> something that, that not only you, but he will remember for the rest of his life. And yep. it's an incredible experience. What was it, I mean, like to, he was there hiking around with you on the whole hunt. What was that like? And, and I, I got to be honest, most people, most guys I know, they wouldn't take their, I know this sounds bad, but they wouldn't take their sons because it is such a, a quote unquote big deal. But that's what I know you. And I know like you, you would have, I mean, you wanted cash there. Like that was oh, yeah. that, like you wouldn't want 100%. it any other way. And, and that's, you know, that's pretty neat. Pretty. It was. What was it like to have, have, have cash there? Oh, it just makes it, it makes it that much better. I mean, you take a great moment, you make it even that much better and you share it with your son and, um, you know, his grandfather was there at the beginning of the hunt, so we got to share it with three generations. I got to share it with three generations of Hurston, and, you know, having cash there was his first sheep hunt, and, you know, it was tough. I, you know, I, sheep hunting's different, and I told him that, and I go, this is going to be different, Cash. We're going to do a lot of sitting. The climbs we do and the hikes we do will be the toughest you've ever done. And honestly, the first day, we, we did 11 and a half, 12 miles of nothing that was flat, broken rock, cactus, nasty stuff. Um, that evening we hunted down in that country um, for the first time. It was a 3,400 vertical foot descent down to the truck and, you know, two hours in the dark. And <laughs> it was a little bit further than I thought. And honestly, like, <laughs> that night as it got dark and we're cruising through, you know, there's some broken terrain under headlamps and I'm holding his hand and it was tough and his feet were sore and um, I was thinking in the back of my head, man, I, I could probably get arrested for child abuse on, on something like that. So it was <laughs> Might have overcooked this one. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it was a cool moment. I watched him grow, and I watched him really understand, you know, that you know these are moments that it's tough and it's challenging. And as I explained to Cash on that, that climb out that night, there's no, I can't help you right now, and I know your feet are sore. I know your legs are tired because mine are too. And you just have to put one foot in front of the other and – eventually you'll get there. And it was like a really cool lesson to see him understand that and grind through it. And I think it was on Monday, um, you know, we climbed to the top of the mountain again and sat there all day, and it was at noon. And I told Cash, I said, look, I know these are long days. I know it's boring that we just sit up here. We had no shade. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't super hot, but still, you know, exposed all day, and you're laying in the dirt and the dust, and everything's got stickers on it. And I said, you know, Cash, if, you, if at any point on this hunt you are miserable, let me know, and I'll find a way to get you home. I can get you to the airport in Palm Springs. I can fly you home. And he said, no way, Dad. I love this. That's awesome. I absolutely That's awesome. We are going to get Goliath, and I want to be here when we do. And um, we woke up Tuesday morning, and he goes, he told me, he said, Dad, today's the day. And it was. And he goes, we'll get him today. And uh, my, uh, my awesome. gut was the same thing for whatever reason, and and he did. And um, it was it was awesome. And, he, and everybody that was there, all the guys that were there, just said the same thing. I can't believe it cash i mean he's just one of the guys that wasn't a problem didn't complain um and was just an added benefit to the whole experience and other experience for everybody that was there was just loved having him there and uh yeah it's a moment he won't forget and, and he talks about it we talk about it every night now that is awesome what an experience well buddy it's been awesome hearing how it all went down you know the, the largest yeah, thank you. I ever shot in the you know, in, in ever and, you know, breaking yeah. 190 inches. I mean, that, that number in itself is it's just is unbelievable to even break that number. Um, yeah. but you know, even more than that, it's, it's, it's one of the best looking sheep I've ever seen regardless of size. I mean, it's just, just, just an incredible open curled ram. I remember yeah. seeing pictures of them before and you showed me some in September and just you know, just jaw dropping ram. I know. Um, I know. Con Maybe congratulations. Together, Jay. Thank you. Yeah, um, and it, it's really cool to see someone that, that, you know, really appreciates it as much as you do, you know. Uh, Nobody more. Anyone that knows who you, you like the logo, yeah. The, the, the logo that Kuyu has always had is a, a, a bighorn sheep, you know, horn. Almost, and to, yeah, it's almost a miniature version of Goliath. To a certain extent, it looks yeah. Goliath bigger. I should redo the logo. Yeah. <laughs> you, should, you should flare out the, the logo a little bit more. And, uh, yeah. It's pretty incredible. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a cool moment. And like you asked, like, where do you go from here? 
it kind of almost motivates me more, you know. It's like, okay, that was incredible. Not that I could ever shoot a, a, a desert sheep that ever topped that, but it's just, you know, let's let's continue to move on to the next challenge. And But certainly still savoring this one probably for a while before I even think about, you know, what's next. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's cool. It's it's a, it's a great moment. It's, it feels like a lifetime achievement award to, to not a better way to describe it. And it feels, it just feels good. You don't get those. That's you don't get awesome. a lot of these moments in life. That's true, and it, it's great that you're savoring the moment. I want to talk uh, just briefly, and then we're gonna sure. we're gonna conclude here. But uh, you know, the amount of conservation dollars that these tags generate, yeah. a, a lot of people, and even some that may be listening to this podcast, don't understand that when that money comes in for that animal, that money goes specifically back on the ground for those animals, not the yep. animals, those animals. So in other words, when the sheep dollars come in for this tag, the money goes back on the ground into these animals. Though, you know, in California. The particular sheep in California, yep. that money goes directly into the wildlife themselves. Yep. It doesn't go into some general fund and all of a sudden it's you know, swallowed up by this or that. It goes right back on the ground. And, it does. Um, the, in my opinion, these tags are so important to be able to uh, have these opportunities for all the rest of the hunters. Um, yep. it's, it's just an amazing thing, this, the, you know, the yeah, conservation model that's been set been, up. Yeah, it does. And in California, I think their dollars are even more important. Not that they're not important for every state, but, you know, California has a lot of desert sheep. The challenge the Fish and Game has is the dollars to survey the other ranges correctly to determine the huntable populations. And one of the things you have to do after you harvest sheep is go and meet with a Fish and Game, and they check it in, and they plug it. And it's something we talked about. And they were so thankful and so grateful for the amount of money I spent on that tab because we talked about those dollars are going to go and allow them to survey some new areas that they know there's huntable populations in, but they haven't had the funding to go do the research in those areas to determine the amount of sheep that then will actually generate additional tags that will go into the draw. And I've known that because I've, I've sat on the board for California Wild Sheep in the past, and that's our biggest challenge in the state is funding to survey the sheep to open up more opportunities for sheep hunting in California and not necessarily like putting in guzzlers, which, you know, they will do as needed. A lot of these sheep can live without the guzzlers, as we proved with this sheep, is the ability to survey those areas and create more opportunity because there are a lot of sheep in huntable populations that we just don't have the money to go do the research to open those units up. And this will, they're telling me how much these dollars are going to go towards that um, and the surveys that are going to be needed. So you, know, you hear that, well, they're taking away tags for the blue-collar guy. Absolutely not. These are dollars that will go towards opening up more tags um, for the general draw that will give more people uh, opportunity to hunt desert sheep in California, which, God, I hope everybody does in their lifetime because it's a, it's a really, really awesome animal to hunt. Absolutely. Fantastic, buddy. Fantastic story. Thanks, um, Love watching uh, the success of Kuyu. Love how transparent you are Thank with you. the company and how you've been and how you've built it. Uh, and uh, just wish you more continued success and blessings moving forward. Uh, and really appreciate, yeah, you. Uh, you know, your company, uh, you know, sponsoring my podcast and, and um, you know, stepping out and, and doing that for, for me and my listeners. That's, that's, that's a, a, a really thing that I, I don't take uh, lightly and I know really you appreciate, know how much appreciate, you appreciate that. It. Yep, happy, I'm and, thrilled um, to be a partner in it and, and amazing to watch your success. It doesn't surprise me. And watching how you build this thing and how, um, how important every single – listener is to you. I think that's just, it's a testament to your success and then so similar to how I believe in building businesses one customer at a time. And uh, man, I can't wait to see how your coos deer season comes up. I'm jealous. I really want to get down and do that hunt again with you. I had so much fun. Uh, I need to get something on the books with you. We should talk that about it this, this winter at the shows is looking at the future and get something booked for the future to get back down and hunt with you for coos deer. Cause I just, that's a, such a fun hunt. And anytime I can hunt with you is always a, a blessing. That's awesome. Yeah, we're really looking forward to the coups this year down there, the rut in January. And um, speaking of shows, for the listeners out there, uh, what shows uh, will Kuyu be at? And, and uh, I, I encourage anyone out there, if they get to these shows, Jason is very approachable. Please go up 
introduce Absolutely. yourself uh, and um, you know give a, give them a chat. And where are you going to be, Jason? So I'll be at um, I will be at all of them, but Dallas. We'll be doing, the booth will be at Dallas Safari Club, um, and then we're going to hit Reno for the Wild Sheep Foundation. We'll be at SCI, and we'll be at uh, at Western Hunting Expo in Salt Lake City. And I'll be at all of them except for the Dallas show this year. Awesome. And, uh, awesome. yeah, any of you guys that, that should come to the show, please come say hi. Let's talk shop. It's, I love talking to people about product gear, hunting, um, and uh, love talking to our customers and your listeners. So look awesome. forward to meeting any of you that I haven't met before. And um, I know I'll see you at the shows, Jay, and look forward to getting together and grabbing dinner together as we do. All right, buddy. All right. Well, God bless and take care. And Happy congratulations holidays. Congratulations again. Okay, you too, yep, buddy. Good, good look. luck in your Tuesday hunts and keep me posted. Yeah, absolutely. All right. All right, Jay. Thanks for having me on. All right, bye. Bye.